This video introduces the chi-squared test for independence, which is the final categorical test that we'll cover in this course. So to recap, we test for independence when we have no prior expectation of the counts, but we want to know if the abundances differ significantly among different samples. For example, if we want to test if the abundance of rock types differs between different beds of conglomerate. So the previous video discussed Fisher's exact test, which is also a test for independence. And you should use it if you have a 2 by 2 contingency table, even if the assumption of fixed marginal totals isn't met. As you'll see in a minute, the chi-squared test isn't well suited as well if some of the counts are very small, and so Fisher's exact test may be better in that case. The chi-squared test does, however, work best for larger contingency tables where nearly all or all of the counts are at least five, like the example here of rock types in four conglomerate beds. So as I just mentioned, the chi-squared test for independence requires categorical data in the form of a contingency table and can accept any contingency table with R rows by C columns, right, where R is three or four or five and C is whatever number. So the purpose is to test for association between the category counts in the different samples with the null hypothesis that the frequencies, also known as the counts, um, are independent of one another among the samples. Another way of saying that is that the counts are equal in all samples or that there is, or that they are independent of one another among the samples. There's no association. There's also a chi-square goodness of fit test, which you, you may hear about, um, but you can and, and should use an exact test like the exact binomial test or the exact multinomial test in nearly all cases. So there's really no need to do the chi-squared goodness of fit test unless you have very large counts that don't work for one of the exact tests. So how does the test work? Well, it compares the observed frequencies to the expectation using the ratio of, on the top, is the sum of squares of the deviation, so observed minus expected, and then that's divided by the expected value. So the tables at the bottom show the observed counts on the left and the expected counts on the right. So for example, because there are 91 quartz clasts in all four samples, the total of quartz is 91, the expected counts, if abundances were independent of sample number, so the same in all the samples, would be 22.75. So those numbers are fed into the formula, basically, for each cell, for each row and column combination, you do observe minus expected squared divided by expected. And they are all then added up to give you the chi-squared test statistic. But we want to know whether that chi-squared value is statistically significant or not. So when the overall counts, when the overall number is large, so that's n, and when all observed counts O are also sufficiently big, the test statistic can be approximated by the continuous chi-squared distribution. Right, so we have discrete data, but the chi-squared distribution is a continuous distribution. So it's an approximation here. The degrees of freedom for that distribution are the number of rows minus 1 multiplied by the number of columns minus 1, r minus 1 times c minus 1. So in this case, sufficiently large, this is sort of the, the, the key assumption of the test, is generally taken to mean that you have at least 50 counts in total. So if you add up all the counts, there's at least 50 individual things that you counted, and no or very few of the observations have, it, have counts smaller than 5. So remember that the p-value in all these tests is defined as the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as large as observed if the null hypothesis is true. And so the chi-squared distribution with appropriate degrees of freedom tells us the expected values that the statistic will take if the null hypothesis is true. So we compare our observed value to that distribution of expected values, and the area under the curve at least as extreme as the observed test statistic is the p-value. So when reporting the results, you should give the contingency table itself, the test name, in this case chi-square test for independence, the value of the chi-squared statistic, the degrees of freedom, and the p-value. You can phrase your, ter your, your results in terms of a significant difference or a lack of a significant difference in the counts or the abundances of the categories among the samples. So in R, the chi-squared test requires just one contingency table as its input. 
And for the type of table that you'll have in the geosciences, it should be formatted so that your categories are the rows and the samples in which you've measured those categories are the columns. So the function is called chisq.test and its output looks like this. It gives the test name and the chi-squared value, which is this x squared, um, the degrees of freedom, df, and the p-value. And so I ran it to make this example on some unsuitable data. There were too many values that were small, and a number of the values were zero for the observed counts. So I got this warning message. And you should actually pay attention to this warning message if, if you get it, because it means that the overall sample size is too small, or more likely that the number of small counts is, is too great. Um, and so you should pay attention to this and, and perhaps reconsider whether the chi-squared test is the most appropriate choice of data or whether you can combine some of your samples to give you a suitable number of, of counts, suitably large counts, or something along those lines.